Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Barely Qualified, a Formula One podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Channing Apodaca. The man across the screen is Brandon Wood. Yo, yo, yo. How you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling tired, a little bit drowsy. I had a really late night last night. We were supposed to do this podcast earlier, and I got your text three hours after I woke up. So uh, that's the type of day I'm having. Yeah, well, better, better late than never. Yeah, so here we go. Round four, coming in hot, heading so. to... Japan Suzuka. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to uh, coming back to Suzuka. This is one of my favorite uh, tracks uh, that we go to every year, uh, and this year it being much earlier on the calendar, it makes it quite interesting because it didn't, wasn't that long ago that we uh, raced here, and so it'll be good to see kind of the progress that the cars have made uh, just in that time. Yeah. So. Gives us a little bit better window, so I'm I'm pretty excited. Yeah, Japan last year was uh, towards the end of the year. I think it was right before Vegas, wasn't it? Uh, it was it was like four or five from the end. So yeah, right up there. And yeah. uh, because it's earlier this year, there's a little bit of weather implications happening. I don't know if you saw that, but they're expecting it to be pretty chilly, and they're expecting rain on Sunday. The race is a Saturday night race, technically, or at least for us, mm-hmm. but. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I don't know how the time zones are working, but they're expecting rain on our Sunday. That might be their Saturday. Yeah, I don't know. Cause, yeah, because we're uh, Pacific Standard Time. So for us, the race will start at midnight, I believe. 10. On Sunday morning. So is it? 10 p.m. for us. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're, they might have a little bit of rain. And uh, from what I heard, they're going to be running the three hardest compound tires as well which I, I thought was a little bit strange if they're expecting cold weather. I don't know how those decisions yeah. are made, but hey, man, if it's going to make yeah, for um, a little bit of uh, ice effect, hey, fuck it, I'm all for it. <laughs> I mean, we yeah, saw what happened just... in you know Australia. When you take out the top guys, anybody struggling just makes for a more exciting race, so fuck it, I'm down. Yeah, I, th- I think sometimes when you get those unforeseen circumstances uh, come and mix things up, it, it does m- end up for a good race. Oh, yeah. Uh, but... But uh, we'll get to Japan a little bit later. Uh, before we get to that, just want to go through uh, a couple questions that we had sent in from listeners. I uh, thought they might be kind of fun to get to. Let's do it. Uh, so the first one is from Greg via Instagram. It says, uh, it's been apparent that Mercedes still haven't been able to fix some of the serious issues with the W15. Uh, with Hamilton seemingly taking more experimental approach in his car setups like last year, Do you think that he's already checked out for this season? Uh, I personally think that he's showing signs of checking out. It's it's pretty early to say that he's checked out for the whole season because Mercedes hasn't brought any sort of an upgrade package. But the way he looks now is, uh, I think the best way you can describe it is um, frustrated at at best. You know, Um, he's got... He spent the last two or three years as basically doing development. And Lewis Hamilton is no fucking development driver, but he's kind of become that for the team because of his expertise. And uh, I think, yeah, he's showing signs of frustration at least and uh, just doesn't seem to be happy where he's at and where the team's at at all. So is he looking forward to 2025 already? Uh, I think he's giving it a side eye. How about that? He's he's squinting at it. He's going, uh... Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it's still a little too early to tell for sure. I think he's going to be uh, continuing to do some of these more experimental setups until he finds something that works for him. I think he's uh, not willing to take the approach that George has and just trying to make the car work as is and get the most out of it because... uh, you know, He, being a more experienced driver, I think... needs a certain feeling in the car in order for himself to feel confident to actually push uh, when he really needs to. So I think until he finds that he's going to be just continuing to search yeah, and not really focusing on those, on those results until he gets something that he feels just baseline comfortable in when that's going to happen. I don't know, but I think as far as his goals for this year, I feel like, you know, he's, at this point, just trying to get back on the podium, you know, I think, yeah. uh, 
uh, I think just having a more short-term goal like that, or like a lot smaller of a goal than say trying to get that race win, I think is, is an easier thing for him to, to focus on and, and we'll probably be less discouraged, but it's hard to really say exactly what's going through his mind. But I think, you know, he's like you said, he's definitely just with seeing the the advancements that Ferrari have made this year and, and, and the, and the promise that they show going into the rest of the season, I think Lewis has definitely already started thinking about 2025 and, and, and what he's going to be focusing on going into that season. Yeah. I think, I think if there's one knock on Lewis, it's that, you know, every driver has to focus on what's in front of them. Not, not always, you know, eyes on the big prize, which is a championship. You have to focus on your race and your race isn't always going to be for podiums or race wins. And when Lewis doesn't have race wins potentially in front of him, I think the frustration shows a lot and his, his determination levels seem to drop. I don't know if that's true because we don't know what's going on in his head or what's going on behind the scenes with the team, but it seems like there's a little bit of a drop off in his drive. And I mean that as mental drive, not his like technical race ability, but if he doesn't have the idea of a race win or possibly a championship in front of him, something about it just looks like he's he's shrugged it off. Who knows? I mean, he's still Lewis yeah. Hamilton, and I, I think we just leave it at that. We know what he's capable of. We know his resume should be a little bit longer, maybe. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I think he's he's definitely taking a look at twenty twenty five and um, bite gritting his teeth a little bit. Yeah, it's, and it's not going to be until the team actually delivers something for him that gives him that confidence, right? So yeah. I think because <laughs> up until this point, he's he's been told by the team time after time, you know, we're, we're going in this direction. We believe that, that uh, you know, we're making these changes towards fixing these issues, and, and it never seems to work out. You know, they have very serious correlation issues with their simulations and actually getting that to... Uh, translate to actual improvements in the development of the car yeah and you know until that happens i don't think lewis is going to be exuding any confidence whatsoever you know what's what's strange is i was like really under the impression that going into this season or like end of last season going into this season that they had finally started taking lewis's word into account i thought that was like an on paper thing that they had like solidified but it seems like they've kind of reneged on that and just like all right we're going to go back to what we've been doing because it seems I, like they're just shuffling deck chairs with these designs. I think the real issue is that they don't know how to make those changes because they make a change expecting a certain result, and then once they get to the track, it's different. It's yeah. opposite of what oh, they maybe. think. So they they're just kind of like chasing their tail a little bit, trying to figure out like what their car is actually doing. Yeah, so, and they're they're showing a lot of the same problems. Like once they get in high speed areas, that car starts bouncing again. So, uh, exactly, that's what I'm saying. Like they're they still are struggling with understanding their car a hundred percent. Yeah. It makes it, it makes 2025 even more interesting because with that spot being open and still being a highly coveted spot, you have to ask yourself, like, even if somebody of a high caliber, like a Fernando Alonso or Carlos signs, even an Alex Albon ends up going there. Is that even a good move or is that a step uh, in the wrong direction? You know, yeah, you can that, take a, is- a, a, an Alex Albon who that's a big leap for a guy like him. But he's also been doing well, and the Williams trajectory has been on the up and up. Is that a right move to go to Mercedes, a team that could be on the slope? Yeah, it's going to be a a calculus that uh, drivers are going to have to make for next year. And so, yeah, that's why we watch, baby. That's the exciting shit. Exactly, exactly. Nothing's for sure. So, all right, moving on to the next question. This this one comes from Kyle J via Instagram. Interesting. Says. Uh, after seeing a Max Verstappen list race in Australia, who do you guys think would win the championship in 2024 if Max weren't on the grid? Oh, beautiful question, KJ. Um, do you want to take this one first? Or do you, uh, should we say it at the same time? <laughs> what were you going to say? I, I, I don't think it's that obvious to me. Really? I think it's... it's yeah. There's one glaring answer for me. And then there are a couple of outliers. Okay. Let's let's hear them. My glaring answer is Carlos Sainz. Hmm. Hmm. I think the way that Carlos has driven and his determination that he showed in the the early going of this season plus coming out of last season, 
is that he's he's all out. He's balls to the wall, completely sending it every single race. And he's the only person visually outside of a few instances that has consistently kept up with Max. Um, and the Ferrari is looking better and better. So I think that uh, him in there is my obvious answer. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I'll give you my fringe guys after you want to give your your first pick. Yeah, I mean, honestly, when I was thinking about this one, Carlos was kind of sticking out for me a little bit just because, you know, you and I have both been a fan of his over the past, you know, two years. I mean, he's been showing out better than Leclerc on, on a lot of occasions. Um, but does he have an in him to go a whole season against Charles? That, that's I don't the know big for question. sure. I, that's it. But I think regardless, it would be an amazing battle between the two yeah. for one and two. Uh, I think it would go down to the wire. Just like we would be seeing uh, little versions of Monza 2023 uh, at a, a few different races. And I think that would be uh, amazing to see. Yeah, I think that I, I do think that Carlos would edge that battle out just based on consistency alone. I think uh, you could con- easily convince me of that. I think that he would, even if he's not, you know, winning the majority of the races, I think he's going to end up podium, podiuming, if that's a word, more than uh, Charles is. So I would give it to him in that edge. And then uh, some of the fringe guys, you know, obviously Chuck himself, I think, is a contender. Uh, and then you can throw Lando Norris in there and uh, a rogue Fernando Alonso, even if they get that car right. So not even putting uh checko, checko. i i, I skipped discussion. over checko how disrespectful of me i think checko should actually probably slot in between carlos and chuck just based on hardware yeah, yeah he should right but you know if he has a a lull in his season like he did last year uh should it you know, should be it. checko's actual nickname sergio <laughs> should perez uh yeah would he be able to to smooth out some of that inconsistency this year um you know with the ferraris maybe looking better i don't know if they're gonna red bull's gonna have as much of an advantage going in later into the season but you know i think checo would definitely be in the mix right there but i don't know that he could beat the ferraris and throughout the whole season yeah so not not on his own not on his own and it, let's uh, let's like dig deeper into this question. So is this of the pretense that Max Verstappen is not racing and there's another driver in that Red Bull car? Or is it under the pretense that Max Verstappen miraculously DNFs every race? Yeah, I think... Uh, is it just a Max Verstappen-less world? Yeah, if he, was just, if he just didn't exist on the grid. So then that would, think. that would posit a world where there's a second Red Bull driver not named Checo Perez. Um, I or, mean, or are we going with a single, uh, uh, some weird one-off season where one team only has one driver? Uh, I mean, if 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 you have any ideas as to like who might actually uh, s- far succeed their current role if they were in the Red Bull car, I'm I'm open to hearing it. You know, I mean, the only two that you could go for, uh, the way I see it right now, would be Yuki Sonoda and Liam Lawson because I don't think Daniel Ricciardo has warranted a drive in uh in the big team yeah so then i mean would that change your calculus for who's going to be champion no it would change my fringe guys i think you could i think you could throw i think you could throw liam lawson's name up at the top of that echelon before you could throw yuki sonoda's and that's no shade on yuki but we have seen his temperament as much as you and i love it and as fun as it is to watch the tasmanian Mm -hmm. devil come out in him I don't think that he would be consistent enough or mature enough to win a championship quite yet. Okay. Which um, has longer implications on the career of Yuki Sonoda as well. Yeah, well, this brings us to the third question that we got. Uh, this question was from Anonymous. Uh, it says, Yuki has shown so far this season that he is uh, ahead of Daniel Ricciardo, uh, but s- with so much turmoil at Red Bull and with word of them looking outside of the current driver pool, what do we think lies in store for Yuki's future? Um, oh boy, I'm gonna. You're the yeah. Yuki. You're the Yuki Stan. I'm gonna let you take this, and and I'll I'll follow up. <clears throat> yeah, this is tough because uh, we did get a little bit of flack when we were talking about Yuki at the race opener. Um, 
just with his little uh, tantrum that he threw, uh, you know, we said we were empathized with him a little bit about his situation being uh, being the guy who throughout that weekend, uh, you know, had the better of his teammate and then uh, pretty much due to no fault of his own at the end of the race, had to give up, let his teammate buy. Um, maybe feeling a little bit of frustration that he's being overlooked within that organization. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people think that Yuki is not in consideration at all with being uh, promoted within the rebel organization. But I think that uh, Yuki still believes that he has that potential and that that seat could potentially, could be his yeah um if he puts in the right um performances so um in his mind i think that's still what he's aiming for is that other red bull seat or a promotion within the organization but i don't it doesn't seem right like right now that that's going to be the case at all i think yeah i could see a world where very well could end up somewhere else yeah i could see a world where yuki is either a, a perennial rb Alpha Tauri, Hugo Boss, whatever the team becomes, I could see him staying with that team for the longevity of his career. Or I could see him taking off and going somewhere else, especially if a Honda deal becomes uh, in, in place for some other team and they want to get a Japanese driver there. I think that could happen. But you have to believe like the whole purpose of that team is for promotion to Red Bull. So he wouldn't be there and he wouldn't have the trust of Helmut Marco and Christian Horner and and the big heads at that organization as a whole, if if they didn't want to see him continually progress potentially towards that seat. They could oust him yesterday if they really didn't see it. So you have to believe that there's something there and there's some kind of belief, at least within the organization, that um, maybe he'll get a drive. They they just have a they have a, a an embarrassment of riches at Red Bull a little bit with a lot of their, you know, Sister team drivers and then just development drivers. They got a lot of talent, you know, mid-level talent, even if that, if it's at best, you know, Ayumi Owasa, Liam Lawson. Uh, who else do they have coming up? They got a bunch of guys who could be, you know, contenders for uh, the three and four spot, we'll call it, at the Red Bull organization. So who knows? Yeah, I mean, the the problem for Yuki is that it's been said that his relationship with Red Bull uh, very much has depended on Red Bull's relationship with Honda and, and Honda very much putting the money up for Yuki to keep his role there because they want a Japanese driver. So with that relationship ending 2026, I think it is uh, Aston Martin uh, going to be uh, powered by Honda. I think that is probably the most likely place to for him to go, but Definitely looking changes at, the the landscape of potential. Yeah, but looking at the actual driver lineups, I don't, you know. It doesn't seem to fit in because you've got the Lance Stroll effect there. There's only one seat yeah, to fill yeah. there. And do you want to fill it with Yuki Sonoda just because of Honda ties? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think he kind of would be fulfilling the role that Lance currently that would be the only spot. Resides, you know what I mean? And that's, I mean, the I mean, only way that happens is if Lance Stroll decides to go play tennis. Yeah, and uh, and if Fernando really is on his way out, and if uh, Carlos is not looking for, or, or is not going to Audi, and, and all these other things that, that could, could be at play. So Yeah, I, I mean, I we're know. heading I into, it, in 2025, 2026, we're heading into one of the most exciting silly season seasons that we could see for a long time. There's going to be a huge shakeup, and we're going to lose, like, I wouldn't be surprised if we lost close to like five or six drivers from the current grid. Very, very easily possible. Yeah. What other questions we got, or is that it? That was pretty much it. Um, we can get straight into our, uh, some Japan predictions if you'd like to. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, just keeping with a the theme, following up on the Yukster, I think Yuki Sonoda finishes, ooh, top eight. Top eight, okay. Yuki in the points, and it's not it's not the one or two point. I, I It's going to be top eight. I. He's been due for a really good Japanese Grand Prix, and I think he has been consistent enough in these last few races. And if he can get his head right, which I think the backlash from, you know, 
that race with Daniel Ricardo in the opening rounds of the season. Um, some of the just, you know, <clears throat> calling out his maturity levels. I think uh, I'm willing to put a little, a couple eggs in the Yuki basket and say that he, he just has a clean, good drive. And there's a yeah, little bit of wishful I, thinking I, there. You love a hometown, I'm right there. a hometown story, you know. And and he's due. He only got 12 last year. He finished behind Lawson. So I think that's nuts. My prediction, my prediction is that not only will he be in the points, but he's going to beat Ricardo. Oh yeah. Um, well, all oh, I thought weekend, that was a given. I don't know if, how. Yeah, I feel like that's pretty get uh, pretty pretty doable for Yuki. Uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think we're going to see one McLaren on the podium, at least. That that uh, takes me to my next prediction. So go ahead and finish were, yours. Yeah, McLaren was good here last year. Um, I think I think Lando's got it in him. I think I think he's due. He finished second last year. Um, Piastri was third, so um, shows some good potential. I think they're also uh, looking good coming out of Australia. They had a a pretty good showing there. You know, especially Lando. Yeah. He got, you yeah, know, what I was some team say, order love, but. I was just going to say, it's really going to depend on the Ferraris, though, because uh, they're both looking really strong. I know Charles is going to want some redemption. Uh, so. Yeah, I think um, it's going to be a three-team podium is going to be my prediction. I think we're going to have a Red Bull, a Ferrari, and a McLaren up there. I would love to see it. Yeah. Um, I want to say Haas Ooh. back in the points. Oh, baby, the dark horse of the season. We could do an entire episode at some point just breaking down what a beautiful sandbag Haas did in the beginning of the season and how they've really just turned shit around. Or or, or are just, uh, uh, you know, getting lucky. I, who knows? I don't think that's it. They they look great, but... Ayo Komatsu was on uh, Beyond the Grid podcast this week. It was uh-huh. actually a really good interview. Uh, just kind of hearing some of his story and... And uh, and all that. So uh, you should check it out. I'll check it out. You guys at home, check it out. Yeah. All right. Is that it? Uh, yeah. Unless you got anything else. Uh, no. Like I said last week, I, I think in the world of Formula One, with all the bullshit floating around, no news is good news. No lawsuits. No charges. No allegations. Let's just fucking race. And we're heading to Japan. Um, I think by the yeah. time this comes out, FP1 will have wrapped. Maybe we'll get it out a little bit sooner. So who knows? Um. But we have a, a fun action pack weekend looking forward to in uh, Shanghai. No, that's China. Uh, uh, in Suzuka. <laughs> Suzuka, Japan. Uh, you know what? I was thinking Shanghai because I was excited that we're getting China back on the grid following this race. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that we're getting it. We have yeah. them back on the calendar. Yeah. Um, very fun. Um, yeah, so uh, Japanese Grand Prix coming up this weekend. We'll do a follow up episode recapping that, seeing how that shit went. Looking forward to it. I think it's going to be. Uh, I think it's going to be a tight one. Yeah, rain or shine, I think it's going to be a good race. So, Yeah, very much looking forward to it. This has been Into the Chicane of Formula One podcast, the pre-Japanese Grand Prix edition. We will see you guys on the other side. Peace. Peace. Qualified.